you don't hear about the kingdom of God, God's government. What his government is. Actually, if you're born again, believe it, you're under God's government. Even though um, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That even though, you know, we might have citizenship here, but our primary citizenship is in the kingdom of God. Where he sits, we sit. Traditionally, where we sit in heavenly places. And we don't never want to forget that fact. We have to remind us, no matter what happens here, that we need to return to God's family. We're part of his system. Praise God. <coughs> and it says in Luke 8 1, and it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. That's what he was preaching about, the kingdom of God coming. And then go to, let's go to Hebrews um, 2 and 6. One is testified somewhere saying, this is a song. What is meant? God in the, he was with the Father in the beginning.
I mean, for years, just help, help me, Lord, be strong. Y'all heard of um, Richard the Lionhearted? Mm-hmm. All right, you know, he went to the Crusades. You know. uh, from what I checked, one of my one of my um, ancestors, Joshua Ron, sold his castle, and he went on the Crusades a long time ago out of France somewhere. But anyway, I mean, that's what I found out. He put that as the information back. But, but anyway, the Richard the Lionhearted went to the Crusades, and his brother John was ruling in England at the time, right? That was William the Conqueror was their grandfather, right? The king from Normandy, right? And there were people fighting over trades. Wherever you worked in the trade, you were not allowed, you're not allowed to, to work in another person's trade, you know, or um, what happened, there was a the plasterers and the stone cutters or whatever, they were fighting over and said, well, we, you know, we, we um, tore our gates, plastered the outside of the buildings and all that, and, um, and um, we also had this breaking on the roof, right, over in England. So what happens is there were other people that were starting to do the work, right, and they went to the king about it and said, they're, getting, they're interfering with our livelihood. You know, they're in there saying, what are we going to do here and all that. And the, the king made a decree, said, all right, um, um, you stone cutters or whatever, you can do this part, these phases of the work on the building. And you can do these other phases. The other craft will have their other phases of the building, but you couldn't do that. So they went to the king about it, and the king made a little decree about it. Because there would have been people that would have been upset by that. Even if you ask people that are not legal here, you know, and they can take work from, from other crafts and everything, if you don't have that much representation here. But a king always 
has to intervene for all of his subjects, everything that he does, he has to provide for them. And our king does that, he provides for us in the same way. But, um, king John wasn't really a very righteous king at all, but you know, he did make the certain decrees there at the time. And so if you have a king, In um, the original Hebrew, it says Hakel. It's his territory. The Lord's territory is his people. Uh, it's also translated his partnership, his sharing. So we're actually in partnership with the Lord. That's what he's actually looking for through all of history. I know Sasha was talking about the tithing then. Where, where, the, where this morning, where we actually, where we actually become a partaker of God's blessings with the tithes and offerings, because God wants us to to share in everything that He does, to be part of that, in everything in our lives, even in a marriage. Did you know that it's actually three, it's not one, because in the Book of Proverbs it says there's a um. There's a threefold cord, right? It's not easily broken. That's where if you have the husband, you have the wife, and you have the Lord, so the Holy Spirit, in holding, and where, where two, if two of the ropes start to feel, the other one can hold it together, can hold the marriage together, can hold everything together. But, you know, if you're single, if you're single, you don't have to feel led out. He said that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So we're never, never alone, even if you're single, so you don't feel like you're disenfranchised or anything. God's always there. He might give you a little more special attention, too, because he said, you know, you don't, you're not, you don't have um, a mate or something, God, to look out for you. He'll spend a little time with you and all that. He'll let you know he's there, looking out for you. That's good to know. Yeah, it is. Especially, especially if you're single, you sit at the house a lot, nobody else is around, all, all these thoughts. Sometimes the enemy tries to attack your, your mind, just these stratagems, right, to depress you, to try to get you to turn away. You know, where if you're single, you really have to, you have to think about things like that, you know. And that's why it's so important that a husband and a wife encourage each other in the Lord, no matter what happens, you know. You, you always believe the best. I remember a uh, pastor I had when I was very, very young. He said, you know, always think the best of each other. And he talked about the husbands and the wives. Always think the best of each other. Don't think the worst of each other. If he, if, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and he's not home, say, well, you know, he's, do, he's doing a favor or he's witnessing to someone. You know, but you always think the best of people. Because the Apostle Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, what, what, what is, whatever things are good, whatever things are lovely, think on these things. Think the best of things. Always think the best of things, not the worst of things. Always think the best. We must do that. That's important. I didn't plan on talking about any of this thing, but I, 
I just believe the Lord is directing us what what we need, what your people need, you know. You can always think the best of other people, not the worst. Oh my God, the battleground's in the mind. Right? The battleground is in the mind. Right. The battle yes. The battleground is the mind. Okay. They um Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones did a sermon on that. Great sermon, one of my favorites one. Back in nineteen fifty nine. But um they still have those things recorded. It's interesting. It's one of my very favorite sermons of all time. God wants the people for itself out of all history. We are his focus. The entire earth is for our benefit. We're partners with God. This is why Jesus went to the cross. This is why he sacrificed. That we might be grafted into his family. That we might be brought into the family of God. It would not be possible if Jesus did not have been to the cross. As we commemorate his resurrection, <coughs> death, the story of his resurrection, it's a communion today. Oh my God. So yes, when you when we accept this, yes. We have to get his new life. Eric Fritz used to say on the cross, you can't see it all. But when you're born again, when you're born from above and you look at that cross, you can't see nothing but death. But when you're born again and you're initiated, you got a whole new life. On that other side, a brand new life on that other side, it used to say, you can't see until you've been initiated. You know, like a, our little secret society, right? You can, and once you're initiated, then you see that brand new life. That new life there. The entire earth is for our benefit. The sun rises and it sets for its people. Or it's, it's, God has it all about us, about you and me. Everything's for our benefit. <clears throat> Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Jesus came, he became our sacrifice, our resurrection. He presented to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. That we're not to be like other people. That we live soberly. A lot of people are not sober-minded at all. It's all right to have joy. Of course, we want to be happy. We want to have joy. But to look at things soberly. The whole world out there is going crazy, man. I don't know how it is. It's about it. the way people drive now. Oh, my God. I don't know how it is here. This is a small town. It, it, it's awful there, man. But, I mean, it, it gets crazy out there, man. People are not there. And sometimes you see people and they don't look right, man. They don't, they don't, they don't look right, man. People, you know, all these weird looks on people's faces and all that. Well, it's very sweet by demons. That's why. If they're not regenerate, not born again, demons are going to manifest themselves more and more in people. It's so important. The only safe haven is in the house of God. Right? Is in yeah, that's it. Ball in the real. Yeah, you got got to do it. Though you have wheat and carrots everywhere. You know? but, but the only safe haven is in the kingdom of God, in his house. Right? Well, we are his house. That anyway, but um, but I've been to some places that weren't so good too. I mean, really, but but <clears throat> but the thing is, is it's supposed to. That's why God's given us the Bible. We know what's right. You know, we just we can avoid that. You know, we can get away from that. You know, but um, but you have to you have to walk towards things. So live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We're not always going to be in the face. He's going to peel it back one day. It's going to be the end. The time is going to be up. We don't know when it's going to be. And um, I see so many young folks that, that die. You don't have to be old. You can go in any time. You know, we never know. Um, teach us to not.
Reminded me of Psalm to teach us to number our days, right? That we can, that we can glorify the Lord. That we number our days. You see, how would you live if this was the last day of your life? You know, there, of course, there's a lot of things we want to get right with other people. We want to get it right with ourselves. You know, right with the Lord and everything else. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, to redeem us, to buy us back out of all the filth, all the iniquity in the world. And and we're we're victims, prisoners of war, actually in the original Greek. If, if we are born again and we start serving God, it's like we're held captive by Satan at his will. We become prisoners of Satan. Exactly. That's what it means in the original Greek. Right. The captured can be captured by him at his will. We might even now have it. He gave himself for us that he might have redeemed us from all iniquity. And God wants to purify unto himself a consecrated, peculiar people, his very own, if he zealous of good works. That's why God has redeemed us out of the world to be his, his treasured possession out of all the people in the world. But not to live like sin, but to live like Christ. To live like Christ Jesus. All through history, you think about it, all through history. But I'll mention this verse right here, Hebrews 5, 9. It says this, that Jesus has become the author of salvation to all them that obey him. He's become the author. Let me see what it says in the American Standard there. I bought this Bible to, to quote it to you because it might be a little easier to understand than the King James. Five nine. And having been made perfect, he became to all those that obey him the source of eternal salvation. The author of salvation to all those that obey him. So our salvation depends on us obeying and following the Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord when you don't do the same? So I say to do it. Oh, yes, we have to do it. Um, it's not just a, a one-time thing where you sign a card or whatever and you make a decision. You've got to make a decision every moment of every day. It never stops. Never there are three main structures that the Lord has thought to be built that he may inhabit throughout human history and continue to dwell there. The first one is the Mishkan, that's the tent of meeting, right? Moses Tabernacle. It wasn't too impressive on the outside. It had mortise and tin and wood structure and tape board. You could put it together like a Lincoln Logs or Legos, you know, and you could disassemble it. It was a wood structure covered with badger skin, linen inside, fencing around it, partitions where it went together. Moses Tabernacle, it was portable. Like, you might say it was like a tent in so many words. Also called the tent of meeting, could be taken down and erected within a reasonable amount of time, carried on staves or wagons. Now, some of the Levites carried the things that were most holy. That was the um, the Ark of the Covenant, the bronze labor, all all these things. These holy items were carried were carried by the Levites on on poles and staves. But all the other stuff, the wooden all went into the wagon where they carried it in, in the wagon when the Lord told them to move. Inside of the Mishkan was fitted and furnished with probably the finest craftsmanship ever. The 
Ark of the Covenant, bronze labor, basins, altar incense, altar for sacrifices, the priests and high priest garments. Um, when the priests ministered in their garments, their holy garments, they weren't allowed to wear them outside. They just had to wear them to church, you know, just like the church clothes today. We do the same thing, you know, we, we have our church clothes. We wouldn't want to go crawl under the cars and on it when our church clothes, right? Or, or, um, or mop the floors or anything like that. We would want to make sure everything everything was put up on a hanger. Um, actually, I don't really like to go out and eat in church clothes, but I'll, I'll do it if I'm hungry, <laughs> hungry enough. But I'll try not to if I can avoid it, you know. But anyway, you don't want to get them all messed up, you know. But they're concentrated, just just like the high priest. He wasn't allowed. He had to change his garments before going back out there. And they might be on a shift for a week or something. You know? I don't know. But anyway, everything was made by hand. Everything. I, and you followed this thing around inside the Mishkan. What is really neat. Uh, Jonathan Cohen talked about this one time. Um, he's a messianic, uh, messianic um, priestly rabbi, whatever. Um, said whenever you would enter this tent of meeting, right, God would tell them when the cloud would move, like the song today, right? The cloud would move. This thing, God might tell them, go ahead and, you know, tear this thing down. We're going to the next place. Where we go? You don't know when the cloud stops, that's where we're going to stop there. So anyway, what happens is you go there, you go there but as the scenery looks a little different. It probably didn't because a lot of it was good and it probably was kind of awful. But, but everywhere they went, it was different scenery. The inside, inside of the tent of meeting, it always looked like it was, um, everything stayed the same all the time. So when you're inside, you don't really know where you're at. Like I work up in Statesboro, now we're down to three days. We work five days a week. And then um, three days a week, then in Savannah, you know, um, I'm home. And sometimes if I'm in a deep sleep, I might wake up and I don't know if I'm up here or down here, you know. After a while, you don't know if you're, you know, if I don't know if I'm in the sound sleep, if I'm in the stage book, or so I have to know, no, I'm here. That's right. But that's the way it was in, inside of the Mishkan. It always looked the same. That means that's because God's presence is always the same. God's presence never changes. He's age to age. He's still the same. El Shaddai, he's always the same. And the thing is, is, it just gets more and more beautiful as time goes on. I like to check it away. The same way. And there was a man named Bezalel that God inspired him when they came out of Egypt. Bezalel, to, um, to craft this work, right, to be, um, to move him over the Holy of Holies and everything. And um, that's, that's what happened actually, too, with George Washington Carver. Actually, he told him, he, um, there was, um, y'all ever heard of Tuskegee, Alabama? Well, that was a black uh, college, traditionally black. Bill Woodson's from there, actually. I'm partnering his ministry. He's been a pretty good fit there. And um, anyway, it was founded by Booker T. Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, he was an ex-slave. His father was white. His mother was a, a black lady. And um, but he found this place in 1881, way down there. He came up from Virginia. And um, and he opened a college for people that were, that were slaves, former slaves, or slave children. You know, where people had no education, weren't reaching out to anybody. And, um, and he asked them, um, he asked this uh, scientist George um, Washington Carver to come on, come on down here. You know, um, I got a position for you and everything. I got a position for you. And um, he said, George, he he, he said, um, Lord, will you show me the, the secrets of the universe? He said, that's reserved for me, George. He said, well, help show me the mysteries of the peanut. He said, that's more like you, George. And he came up with like about three hundred. Different uses of peanut milk, all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, peanut butter, you name it. I, makeup, probably too. Every, everything, you know. But it was cool. But he said all he did, all he did. God put these uh, skills in Bethlehem, right? The George Washington Carver said the only thing 
he did, he's doing his laboratory. Go check what he took a little pad and the Lord would tell him things and he was sort of writing down what the Lord said. That's all he did. And where he downloaded from the Lord all these things that he showed him and everything. And actually in the early um actually what happened was after like in 1905 1905 like 20 20 something years right after they founded tuskegee tuskegee institute was graduating more self-made millionaires than, than harvard yale and maybe some other princeton or somewhere at the time I mean, and people coming out of slavery, coming out of humble means. God's taking people out of humble means to do something. And that's the way it is with us. God takes us, you know, that we're, we're not the most esteemed people in the world. But if, but if we serve the Lord, he can, he can make you an expert in something, a genius in anything. It doesn't matter what you are. The same way we did with George Washington Carver, the same way he did. With that well, it's amazing that craftsmanship. I'd love to say that, but I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. But but um, the Lord made a way for them to do all this stuff. And the, even you, you can't feel like you don't have nothing to offer. You can't figure that you have nothing to do until you really do. If you're born again, you've got more than anybody else does. Actually, I'd rather I'd rather have um, Jesus than a than a Yale education, right? Well, any day of the week. <laughs> and then you can get yourself in trouble if you got a lot of education too. You know, if you don't, if you don't know the Lord, you know, education is a great thing. Don't get me wrong, but education outside of God always gets better. So it doesn't matter where you're at, God. If God's looking out for you, that's all that matters. The tab. All right, the tabernacle outside changed often, but God's presence. Stay the same inside, the indwelling place of God. All that great, <clears throat> but close, all that great. But the closer we get into the presence of the Lord, things are really more beautiful inside. The Christian life is the same way it is spirit. It gets more beautiful and beautiful no matter where you journey through your life. Here. What happens is, when they left Egypt, they were slaves. The children of Israel were slaves. They left Egypt. And they actually stripped Egypt, where it says, ask them to lend you gold and silver and apparel. So they took everything with them when they came out of Egypt and they stripped it. They brought everything. You know, there was no grain left because the locusts had eaten everything. There's nothing that just bare dirt, dirt everywhere. No cattle, everything was wiped out. So the children of Israel took everything with them, gold, silver, you name it. The Lord told the Egyptians to give the wealth to Israel before leaving Egypt. A wealth transfer, in fact. Those were back wages for all that work they did. Retroactive pay, they call it. Okay. This material wealth is what they actually built. They actually built the um the Holy of Holies was, right? You had the Ark of the Covenant, the bronze paper and all, all this gold and silver and brass. They got it from Egypt when they came out for this wealth transfer. So all these things, the Lord can give us whatever we have as far as if he's giving you a trade, right? He's giving you a trade and he's increasing, right? But it's always for a reason. If you get, If you're making more money, it's always to put back. We might not build an Ark of the Covenant. We might not do that. We might not be building a bronze labor, but we're building in the kingdom of God here. This, this place is rented, right? And, and it has to be paid every month, right? Okay. Electricity, where people could come in and, and whatever, whatever, um, whatever the kingdom of God needs, when we put into the, it, it takes the wealth that we take from our jobs, from where we're blessed, and we put it back into his kingdom, and he will turn it over, and he'll multiply it back to us. 
that whatever we do, that we grow in that, and your your giving should always be increasing, right? And God should increase. And He also said, and He increases the fruits of your righteousness by Him. As you do it and you get in the habit of that, it actually increases the fruits of our righteousness as we grow in Christ. Where your heart is is where your treasure is. Amen. So wherever you wherever you put your money at, you can tell a lot about a person about what they spend their money on. Mm-hmm. You know, their checkbook or their credit card statement. You can find out a lot about people. Just where do they what what how how much do they give in the kingdom of God? What do, what do they do with their money? That tells you a lot about that. That's a, a biography right there. You know? So how much how much do you spend? How much do you put in the kingdom of God? What do you put your money on? What do you spend your time at? What do you spend your time doing? What kind of programs do you watch on television? You know? How many videos do you let you go on your own? But we take these things, we take these things, and we put it back. This world change where we put it back in the kingdom of God. We don't know where the country will go. You know, um, there's been a lot of godly people here in a few hundred years that are the, are the foundation of this country. Not perfect people, but I'm sure godly people that founded this nation. And they get taught just like us. And um, our parents, our grandparents, knew the Lord and everything. We don't know what kind of condition this country is going to go in. You know, there's a lot going on now. I think they want to go to a digital currency. They, um, there's a lot of unrest. There's inflation. There's all kinds of things going on, you know. And um, the thing is, is, is problems are just going to increase in this world, and nobody's going to be able, nobody's going to be able to stop them because it's it's like Babylon. It's just going to, it's made to fail. The only system that works is God's system. Amen. His system works. And uh, I think Brother Will, you know, I think, uh, I was looking at a picture of Brother Will last night, you know, I was thinking about Brother Will. Um, uh, He said one time, he said that they they found out the only system that worked was to be the way that they reset everything seven years in in the Torah and the Old Testament, that that was the only system that actually worked. They said, we can't do that because it's Jewish. You know, I said, well, well, but you, we struggle to with God, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, that's the way it is. But, I mean, the way the system was is the government, you know what I mean? They reset everything. Everything fails here, but we don't know. You have digital. You have um, fiat currency that's not backed up by gold or anything. And if you print more and more of it, it loses its value and all that. I think people are trying to do, I think they're trying to do what they think is right. You know, I know that they are. But it's, it's not going to get any better. And eventually, things are going to get so bad that there's some antichrist to come up here. I can solve all your problems. You know? <laughs> but um, but the thing is, you can't rely on this world. Amen. Oh, my God, you go in the grocery store or anything, God's system works. And no matter what else here, if you trust in him, and you, and you put your treasure in God's kingdom, you trust him. You love him. You give your life to him. He'll make it work out no matter what's going on here. Amen. The trust in him, not in yourself. Right? Amen. That's how you do it. You can't do that. I didn't plan on talking about all these things, but I guess they're worth mentioning. But um, anything, the next thing, the next thing that um, structure that was built was uh, Solomon's temple. Oh, my God. Solomon's temple was next. Um, the Mishkan, <coughs> Paso Paul said, uh, we can't speak particularly on these things in the time of the Apostle Paul because they didn't know where the Ark of the Covenant was. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't know where all these things were at the time. Aaron's rod and budded and all that, that used to be in that used to be deposited in the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, you know. And it said that they didn't know where these things were after that, after the captivity and all. But the next, the 
The next floor building was Solomon's Temple, probably the most elaborate, expensive building in the history of the world. Now, God commissioned both of these to be built. He commissioned, he commissioned um, the tent of meeting to be built. It was told by God to do it. And uh, Solomon's Temple, God commissioned that. Probably the most elaborate and expensive building in the history of the world. Possibly not enough material and craftsmanship available to build the very same building today. Not a cut down version of the veneer, you know. You see the newest cars, they have all these nice designs and all that. But a lot of things are plastic. You don't have that you wouldn't you wouldn't want to get in a wreck with it if it crunch. That's a you spend a lot of money on it, you know, it's not a a lot of metals, you know, like the way they were probably 15 years ago or whatever. So that's what it means. You couldn't build the very same building again that would be gold all the way through or something. You know what I mean? Not just electroplated. You all know what electroplating is? Okay. Yeah. All right. You see these cities now? You see them? Well, there's no copper in them. It's just a little a little covering on the outside of the inside, probably a tin or something like that. They don't sound the same the way they go. Um, that's that's like an electroplating on these paintings. And you just have a little copper and it, then it can actually wear off if you rubbed it on the cement or anything or a sandpaper, it just rubbed right off. It's not it's not there anymore. But you couldn't build the same building today. You had first growth timber. You know what first growth timber is? Okay, most of the timber you get from the lumber yard today uh, don't have many rings in it, okay? You don't have that many rings. And so they harvest it about every 15 years to sell it commercially at an affordable price. But when the first settlers came to Savannah, some of the live oak and majestic oak trees and, and um, long needle pine, they had all these rings in there, right? And so that wood is actually better wood, a lot better wood. So when this when this temple was built, you had first growth timber back then. You know, you had first growth timber when this was built. Pure gold, all work was done by hand, inspired by God Himself. All right, and King David, he wanted to build the temple so bad. He wanted to build the temple. He personally gave. 100,000 talents of gold himself to the building, the fund of building the temple, right? You know how much a talent is? 75 pounds, man. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at 75 times 100,000. That means it was 7,500,000 pounds. 7 million pounds of gold, man. Um, and um, I think I look. I I researched this one time. Gold was like 1979, 1979 per ounce, right? Almost two thousand dollars for for an ounce of gold at the time. And um, it ended up being at like two hundred and thirty-seven. Billion dollars, billion dollars worth of gold, 504 million after that. So you're you're just under you're just under 238 billion dollars worth of gold alone that he just gave at the time into this structure. He gave a uh, hundred thousand talents of silver. This ended up oh my God, 31. Billion dollars, fifty-six million dollars. After that, he gave all of that to this Solomon's temple, and they gave more after that. David also gave bronze, iron, beyond the counting ability, almost limitless timber. He just couldn't number any of this stuff. And the stone he also prepared for the work of the house of God. You know, David wanted to build this temple. David wanted to build this temple so bad. 
It was his heart's desire. You know, he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord very much. But what happened? It's a sad story. You know, um, he was sitting. Um, I think um, the prophet, the prophet told him. Uh, he said, "Well, I want to build a house for the Lord. I want to do this thing. I want to do this thing." You know, and he said, uh, "He said, you know, you're a man of blood. You're a man of blood. I, uh, you can't do this. I can't let you do this. But your your son can do it. But you've been a man of blood. But but it's been disputed. Um, he was a soldier, right? But." It's been mentioned that it might be because of murdering Uriah the Hittite mm -hmm. to get his wife. You remember Bathsheba, mm -hmm. right? It might have been for that incident, you know, for doing that and then covering up the adultery and had him sent to the front line, you know, under Joab, right? To be killed, he might have been. He might have made reference to that, you know. To, you know, you can't touch, you know, the holy things of God for that. It's been mentioned that your greatest weakness, your greatest weakness, could keep you from reaching your greatest desire. Your greatest weakness that you let rule in your life. Whatever it is, whatever your greatest weakness is, it's different for everybody. But everybody has it. It can keep you from from achieving what you really want more than anything else. And, um, and I'm thinking I might just stop right there today. Um, I've got a lot more. I, I think y'all might get, get a little restless if I keep on, but. Uh, but I think I'll just stop it at that point again and everything. But don't let your greatest weakness take away your greatest desire. Amen. 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 Don't do that. Greatest. Yeah. Your greatest weakness take away your or prohibit you from getting your greatest desire. So it's every day. You have to, every day, every single day of your life, you have to say, Lord, Romans 12, 1, I put myself, I put myself on the altar to be a living sacrifice. Let me, let me turn there. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I therefore urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Every day, what I want, what I think, what I feel, what I want, what I think, what I feel, if God tells you to do something, do it, no matter what it costs you. Yeah. Whatever it costs you, yeah. do it, do it, do it. Or if you don't hear anything, if you don't hear anything, say, well, what's God's word say? If, yeah. it's, if it's against God's word to do, then that's the word right there. You don't do it. You become the living sacrifice. God, Yes. Yeah. Yes, it. So you don't do it. Okay? And he said, do not be conformed to the world. Don't be beat into the patterns of this world. Do all the things the way the world dresses, the way the way um the way they may talk. They may they, they might be using these certain words, they might not be nasty words. But it's in the mold of this world. Come on now. It's in the mold of this world that passes away. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that 
the renewing of your mind, so that follows um, of the laws of etching Jesus. It follows. You become the living sacrifice. You put your body on the altar, and then leaving yourself open for your mind to be renewed as God can speak to you once you put yourself on that altar. Once you submit to him, then he will communicate with you in whatever way that he will communicate you with. Then, that's how you do it. So that you may prove what is the will of God yeah. after this, right? In whatever situation you might find yourself in, that you'll find out what the will of God is. That which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Yeah. Okay, right afterwards. All right. For though the grace given to me, I through the grace given to me, uh, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as to have sound judgment. God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Okay, now you are uh, even a measure of faith. Um, even you have a measure of faith to get saved. Yeah. You have a measure of faith that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. That you believe um, for salvation, everyone is given a measure of faith. Yeah. And you also. Whatever he calls you to do, or whatever he wants you to do, that he will show you after, after you all that living sacrifice. But do not think too highly of ourselves when we also think of this. Okay. Um, the apostle said one time, he said, um, um, what do you have that you have not received? What do you have that you have not received? But if thou hast received it, um, why are you glorying as if you had not received it? So if you have something given to you, if you have something given to you by God and you just received it, you can't take any credit for it. You can't be Right, he gave it. It was a gift. So that's it. So that's the gift. We can't we can't say, well, I made all this happen. You, you know, no, man. God makes it happen if it's a gift. And whatever gift God gives you, it's to benefit your fellow Christians with. Right? Amen. Everything is the gift that we benefit and minister to each other in whatever way that God gives us the capacity to minister and, and help our brethren, right, and sisters, right, in whatever way. That's a body. You have bodies just like you have hands. You have all these different parts. You have all these different parts of the body and how they work together that you must, that, um, that you must have all the parts of the body. Um, I don't believe you have one body of Christ here and one body of Christ here, but there's only, only one body. <laughs> that would that'd be a monstrosity. <laughs> You had all these bodies of Christ, but there's only one, and um, he's the head, he's the boss, he's the sovereign, amen. amen. So I'm, I'm going to stop it right there, I believe, and uh, amen, the, the Lord willing, continue next time on, on what, we're, what we're covering there.